Happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to today's Master Builder Solutions webinar. We thank you for joining these this year, and we are glad to be able to continue to provide you with these valuable educational opportunities, as you've come to expect for over 30 years. My name is Vicki Strand, the Director of Marketing for Construction Supply Group. As we integrate with the Whitecap team, we are combining to better serve you. Our mutual commitment to being better together and building trust on every job will continue with exceptional service and knowledge of the industry. We are in process of adding a few more webinars to our series, so please check your email early next week for a few more details. As a reminder, today's presentation is an AIA-approved one-hour, one HSW credit event. Today, we will learn about waterproofing and protection of vehicular and pedestrian traffic surfaces. Before we get started, we would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We do have everyone muted as to eliminate any noise and distraction and provide you a great learning atmosphere. We've taken a screenshot of an example of your attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions during today's event to the presenter. You may send in your questions at any time. We will be collecting these and address them at the end of the Q&A session. I would like to introduce today's presenter, Dave Fuller, Technical Services Lead, Master Builders Solutions. Dave has been in the construction materials industry for 30 years. He has held technical positions for PPG, ICI, DeGusa, and BASF. As a subject matter expert in coating, sealant, flooring systems, and concrete repair materials, Dave is involved with field investigations, product development, complaint and claims management, as well as technical training. He has designed, developed, and delivered in-person and virtual technical training programs throughout his career for customers and internal employees. Dave holds a master's in adult education and training and is responsible for the development and delivery of technical product training for Master Builder Solutions. Thank you, Dave, for joining us and being a part of our webinar. Are you ready to begin? Yes, thank you, Vicki. And thank you for everyone joining today. Uh, like Vicki said, today we'll be talking about waterproofing and protection of vehicular and pedestrian traffic surfaces. Uh, basically, we're going to talk about deck coating waterproofing membranes. Uh, like Vicki said, this is part of the AIA, and you can uh, receive your AIA credits through this course. It's about uh, an hour long with a Q&A uh, included in that. Uh, basically, we're going to talk about means and methods of using these materials to uh, to waterproof these these decks. Uh, we're going to start by talking a lot about the uh, the technologies as well as procedures for installation. So there's there's a lot. We're not going to go way down deep in any of these, but we're going to give a good overview of some of the important things that we need to think about when we're using these materials. So by the end of this, uh, we should be able to. Uh, have a good idea of how to specify certain uh, materials, especially when we talk about the different technologies out there, because we have to re remember there's not that one magic bullet uh, to use in all instances that is going to give us success in these type of projects. So we have to talk about the benefits of all these technologies, but also their limitations as well. Uh, and we're going to understand the critical steps to uh, have this uh, an effective strategy when using these materials. And also some of the options where we can maximize the aesthetic impact of these protective coatings because they not only protect, but they can provide that aesthetic value as well. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, basically the function of these traffic bearing membranes. We'll go into the technologies, then some of the key aspects of installation uh, which really help us with those keys to success. And then we'll wrap things up and take questions. So let's start with the function of these traffic bearing membranes. 
you could say their their main uh, four functions, uh, but a couple couple more added in there as well. We, we're offering waterproofing protection, skid resistance, wear resistance, aesthetics, even chemical resistance, and cleanability uh, as part of these uh, as part of the function with these materials. Let's talk about each one of these just a little bit deeper. But when we talk about waterproofing protection, uh, this is where we want to take a structure. Uh, looking like that left-hand side and bring it back to the right-hand side. What we're doing here is really uh, preventing the ingress, ingress of moisture and harmful contaminants that are going to degrade our concrete structures. So think chlorides, think carbon dioxide. Uh, and really with that, we have to provide a, a flexible membrane that's gonna be able to bridge cracks and moving cracks to a certain degree. Uh, so we can keep these structures uh, intact and further prevent corrosion, uh, deterioration of these structures by using these materials. But at the same time, we also uh, especially when we look at traffic conditions for vehicular traffic, we need that skid resistance. And with the uh, with the addition of aggregates and certain technologies, we can offer that skid resistance. The photo here shows a perfect example: uh, a helix. If this is a, in a, a a wet condition down here where I am in Florida, or up in up in the north where we can get uh, uh, freezing rain and things. Uh, with that aggregate, we we can't provide a uh, we have to provide a certain level of skid resistance to prevent these uh, safety issues. Issues from from occurring uh, with skidding out of, of vehicles, and we all know a lot of these. Uh, if that's an if that particular um, helix there is from an airport, and we know uh, how fast people can can fly through airports and and their vehicles, uh, but also as well as slip and falls, a major major uh, uh, issue in our industry. Uh, with slip and falls. So we have to have a certain level of slip resistance as well. And that's where these aggregates and different top coats come in to provide that layer of safety. Uh, so we're not creating slick surfaces when we're, when we're waterproofing these areas. And I mentioned before, aesthetics, more and more, our, our customers are expecting more in the aesthetic value of these materials. It's not only enough to have them function as waterproofing and extend the life of these structures, but we want to beautify these structures as well. Everything from a, a, the entryway to a medical building like we see on the left-hand side there, or a high-rise condo on the beach. Uh, we're bringing more and more colors into the, uh, into the equation with these materials. And again, we, our customers are expecting aesthetic value. So uh, that comes from not only the materials, but how we apply them as well, uh, which is how we have to spend, spend a little time on the installation uh, today, because that makes such an important, uh, uh, it's a, such an important aspect of bringing that aesthetic value into the mix. Now, chemical resistance as well. Now, these materials have to not only resist the general uh, fluids and different chemicals coming out of our vehicles, which are going to be uh, dropping on the uh, on the surface of a of a parking deck, so to speak, like we see there on the right hand side, um, but even uh, areas where we may do equipment rooms and and waterproofing those areas, there's certain oils and chemicals they need to be resistant uh, to as well, because not only uh, are they there to protect the concrete, but they they have to stand up to these chemicals themselves, uh, so they don't decrease grade. So we do provide that uh, protection to, uh, to the structure. Uh, another example would be uh, just some of the chemicals that we, we find in a, in a stadium, some of the food and beverage chemicals from, from beer to ketchup and, and tomato sauce. Uh, those materials can be very aesthetic and degrade concrete and uh, certain building materials very rapidly. Uh, so these materials are providing a, a level of chemical resistance in those kind of instances as well. Uh, so really, when we look at it, we have our basic waterproofing protection. First and foremost, these materials are functioning as waterproofing materials. We have the slip and skid resistance to provide that layer of safety that's needed in all these areas, whether it's a vehicular type of application or a pedestrian application. Uh, we have the aesthetic value more and more. 
our customers are expecting to to beautify their structures uh, while maintaining that that waterproofing and and safe environment and finally that chemical resistance so those those are really the main functions and why we're using these materials in the first place so let's talk about a little bit more about what types of materials that we uh, we consider when we look at these uh, waterproofing membranes the you see here the the most common technologies that are available out in the marketplace. Uh, we have our polyurethanes, both single component and multi-component. We'll talk a little bit about the difference between those. We have epoxies. Most of us are aware of epoxies, everything from coating our garage floors to uh, you know widespread applications in supermarkets and big box stores. Uh, but epoxies also are used in these applications as well, and they have their purpose. Uh, polyurea is another uh, popular material out on the market that we'll talk about. And the methyl methacrylates, uh, very growing in popularity the last five or 10 years out in the marketplace. And we'll, what we call hybrid systems, and this is where we combine some of these different technologies into one system. And many manufacturers are doing that more often now and taking kind of the best of both technology approach uh, to come up with a specific solution for the customer. And finally, cementitious, uh, which are used more especially for their permeability, uh, where slab and grade applications, uh, things of that nature, uh, where they have that breathability, so we don't have to worry about uh, moisture conditions as much. So we'll talk about each one of these uh, a little more. We'll start with polyurethanes, a single component polyurethane. Now, single components, just there's no mixing of a curative agent or anything. Generally, these materials cure uh, by a moisture cure reaction uh, where they react with the moisture in the air to start that cross-linking, to start that chemical reaction where they cure. A lot of uh, advantages to this type of technology, and it's really the workhorse of the industry and it has been for decades. Um, other technologies are, are coming uh, more and more in, into the mix as we develop and improve materials, uh, but the single component polyurethanes really still are the, the standard in the marketplace uh, because they do have a lot of advantages. Uh, UV stability, now most of these technologies that we'll talk about have, need some degree of UV stability. Uh, because of where we're installing them. Um, but polyurethane has, a, has a, a great track record, a long track record of good stability in UV applications. Uh, they have very good wear resistance. Mentioned before that, you know, with the traffic, whether it's vehicular or heavy pedestrian traffic, uh, these materials have to keep standing up to that. They can't wear away uh, or they're not going to provide that important uh, function of waterproofing. Uh, so they have great wear resistance. Uh, the flexibility, uh, when you look at all these materials in exterior environments that are going from hot to cold to hot to cold, and uh, our, our materials, especially concrete, that you know it, it shrinks and expands in those type of uh, thermal cycling conditions. Uh, they need that level of flexibility uh, to prevent cracking um, because a, a waterproofing membrane with a, with a crack that goes through it is no longer a waterproofing membrane. So we need that flexibility. Very easy to clean. I mentioned before in these cases where we're using uh, maybe in a stadium uh, where we're using all these different uh, foods and, and chemicals and things, they need to be able to clean. Again, going back to that aesthetic value of the materials. Uh, one of the other reasons they're they're so dominant in the marketplace, they're affordable. Uh, they're, they are uh, cost effective. They're cheaper than some of the other technologies out there. Even the labor costs to install them because they're a little easier. You're not uh, worried about, you know, quick working times where, you know, you have to have more labor on site to install those multi-component materials sometimes. So uh, they do prove to be uh, more affordable than some of the other technologies. And I mentioned before, they've been around for decades. So we have that proven track record in the industry. But like I mentioned, every place, every material has its place. Every material has its limitations as well. Uh, lower solids, less build. And what I mean by that is a lot of these materials are, say, probably average around 75 to 80 percent solids by volume. And that means once they cure, we're losing 15 to 20 percent of the overall film. 
that's evaporated, that's used up in the curing process. Uh, so if we put, you know, 20 mils down, we're probably going to end up with somewhere of 15 or so. So that's that's another thing that we need to logistically bring into the uh, equation when we're using these materials, re realizing that, well, if we're comparing it to another material, uh, it's really what's important is what's left after the curing process. And these, these materials generally are going to have a little lower solids than some of the other technologies out there. Uh, they're slower cure. I mentioned before, they, they, they react with the moisture in the air, especially in dry conditions. Uh, dry, cool conditions, these materials take a while to cure. Uh, whereas at, you know, on a, a, a normal 70 to 80 degree day, uh, they may be ready to cure, uh, ready to coat in 12 to 24 hours. In very cold, uh, dry applications, uh, it could be two, three times that long before they're ready to uh, be recoated. Uh, same thing when turning them over to traffic. Uh, oftentimes after these materials are installed, it can be 48, 72 hours uh, minimum before they're ready to be open to traffic. Um, add cold temperatures and dry conditions, and that can be extended greatly. So they, they do uh, take a little longer to cure than other technologies that are out there. And I mentioned that impact of uh, temperature and, and moisture. Now, moisture also, they can be moisture sensitive in very humid environments. Uh, they can react with that uh, moisture and uh, cure a little too quickly. Uh, causing, you know, blistering and where, you know, the material, these materials kind of cure from the, from the top down. Okay. Uh, so they can, uh, in certain conditions, they may skin over trapping solvents, trapping gases like carbon dioxide and nitrogen within the film, which can cause some issues. So uh, again, they do have uh, that sensitivity to uh, moisture with damp conditions. And they do generally uh, have some amount of a solvent in there, so there is that odor. Uh, so care has to, caution has to be used when using these in, you know, uh, poorly ventilated areas around public. Uh, you know, very close proximity to the public, you can get odor issues and complaints uh, related to that. But after all that, they're still one of the most popular materials that are out there in the industry. Now, we'll switch over to polyurethane. Now, two component, uh, some are three components, so we'll just call them multi-component as a general rule. A lot of advantages to multi-component polyurethanes. One is their faster cure. Uh, if you compare it to a single component urethane, these materials where a single component uh, urethane may cure in 12 to 24 hours, like I mentioned on the last slide, these materials are now curing in three to four hours, maybe even a little less in the right conditions. So now a, an installer can uh, put down multiple coats in a day, open these areas up to traffic in as little as 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so we're getting that quicker return to service. And that's where these materials are a, a little bit more expensive than the, the single component urethanes. Um, on average, as a general rule in the industry, anywhere from 15 to 20%, maybe even a little, uh, little higher than that. Uh, but when you look at the quicker return to service and quicker return to revenue for the end user, um, that can be uh, considerable cost savings uh, well beyond the uh, material uh, material cost. Uh, the lower odor makes these materials uh, very easy to use in interior spaces like mechanical rooms, um, you know, around the public where we can install these materials around, say, a supermarket or hospital that's, you know, people are walking in and out 24-7 much less chance of complaints due to odor because most of these materials, and you'll see the third bullet point there, they're higher solids. They're almost 100% solids in a lot of cases, somewhere in the high 90s as a general rule. So there's very little, um, really no solvents in there uh, that, that, are, uh, that cause odor issues. Um, there could be some exempt solvents in there, but the, they're generally they're very low odor, these materials. So much easier to work with, with uh, around the public. Uh, I mentioned the higher solids. So as a general rule with those high 90% solids by volume type of materials, it, now if you put 24 or 25 mils down, you're not getting 20 mils once it's cured. You're getting 24 point 
eight or maybe even 25, uh, you know, very little uh, loss in the curing of these materials. So that's a benefit as well. Excellent wear resistance, all the other uh, things that I listed in the single component urethanes, whether it's uh, wear resistance, UV stability, flexibility, uh, they have all that as well. Um, but in a package, in a product that's going to result in a quicker return to service. So that's one of the big features of the multi-component polyurethanes. Limitations. These require careful mixing from the installer. And if they're not, if that process isn't done correctly, uh, it can lead to issues. It can lead to curing issues and, uh, and, and other um, negative um, issues on in the field. So uh, very, very uh, critical that the installers uh, use those mixing processes and applications uh, processes correctly because they do have a pot life. And generally, once these materials, all those components are mixed together, uh, it's a, a, a the installer generally has you know somewhere between 15, 20 minutes to get it out of the bucket, uh, spread around the surface, and whatever needs to be done, you know, broadcasting or, or whatnot, uh, in a very short amount of time. So now we need you know some extra labor from the installer to be able to handle those those that quick turnaround uh, with the material. So so, um, so, and I mentioned it's a higher material cost, but when you look at uh, the faster return to service on a lot of projects, that's going to result in a lower overall installed cost uh, with those materials. Now, epoxies, I mentioned before, we're generally all familiar with epoxies when interior environments and floors and things of that nature, and they, they do they have a lot of advantages. Uh, again, very fast setting usually in a matter of hours, two, three, four hours, uh, depending on the, the, the exact uh, technology that's used uh, in the epoxy. Uh, so they're pretty fast setting, uh, very low odor. In most cases, these materials are, again, very high solids, 100% uh, down to maybe 95% solids, uh, very low odor. And you'll always have a chemical smell. There's, there's no such thing as an odor-free uh, deck coating or waterproofing membrane. I've, I've yet to see it out there. They all have some kind of odor, but it's usually generally with these type of materials, there's a little bit of a chemical smell. In the case of an epoxy, there's a little bit of a mean, you know, a sweet amine smell, but it's not a solvent, not harmful. Uh, they're user friendly in most cases. A lot of these, are, they're easy to mix. Um, uh, some of the materials are, you know, a gallon of part A and a gallon of part B, so you're not measuring uh, things out a lot, and and they're generally pretty forgiving uh, in the mixing process. But the big advantage with the epoxies is the high strength, the high compression, the high tensile strength. These materials uh, wear have the, you know, pretty much the superior wear resistance of the technologies that are out there, uh, and that's why they're used in some of these aggressive areas. Everything from a highway bridge deck uh, to uh, you know to an interior space with um, tow motors that are you know smacking their forks down uh, for that uh, you know that that heavy impact and things. So that's where uh, they really have an advantage over other technologies. A couple things with those advantages, uh, they are pretty rigid uh, as a general rule. Yet. There's some flexible epoxies out in the marketplace, but as a general rule, when we're looking at the whole uh, market out there, uh, they're pretty rigid. Uh, so there is that potential for, for cracking. So we gotta be careful that we're not going over moving joints and moving cracks unless we're, uh, we're detailing those uh, according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, they're not by themselves, they're not UV stable. Uh, so generally, they're going to be used with some form when they're in an exterior environment, they're going to be used with some form of a UV stable top coat over them. Uh, there are cases where they're broadcast to refusal with a with an aggregate and just left that way. But it's really the aggregate that's exposed to the UV, not really the uh, material underneath. Um, and there's some, you know, plasticizer staining. They 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 have a higher degree of potential where parked cars are on them for for a while, uh, depending on the type of tire and the heat that that tire emits, uh, they can actually uh, 
have staining from the plasticizer with it in those tires. So uh, again, those those are kind of particular applications, particular uh, instances where that uh, occur. But one of their big limitations uh, for when we're looking at this market is the uh, is the rigidity of the of the material by themselves. They're not going to have those crack bridging properties and flexibility that I mentioned before. Uh, methyl methacrylate, not quite as uh, not quite as uh, common as some of the other technologies, but more and more they uh, they've been introduced to the to the marketplace. Uh, their big advantage are, are are two. The the first is rapid turnaround. So now it's not a matter of hours; it's more of a matter of minutes. Uh, instead of three or four hours, now we're looking at uh, 30 to 45 minutes in most cases, and and that's ready for traffic. That's ready to recoat. Uh, really interesting technology, and these materials uh, right out of the bucket are generally fine, you know, down to below freezing, say 20 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Um, and with additives, depending on the material, uh, I've seen methyl methacrylates go down successfully and cure in an hour down at 20 below zero uh, Fahrenheit. So, uh, very interesting technology. They do have a high strength uh, and and very good adhesion to concrete substrates. Um, but when we look Look at the limitations for methyl methacrylates. They do have a ex distinctively high odor, uh, and that can be, uh, you know, troublesome around public areas, interior areas. So um, mixing is critical with these materials. Uh, the mixing is done uh, based on the temperature, the surface temperature. So the installer adds a certain amount of uh, um, uh, dibenzoyl peroxide to start the curing process in these materials and that amount is based on the temperature so the installers have to you know have to be pretty pretty precise with some of the the mixing with these materials and these materials are are higher cost even than the the multi-component uh, urethanes they, they generally even add another uh, 10 or 20 percent to the to the cost of those materials but looking back again when you can decrease that uh, um, downtime for an owner, many projects, it's it's well worth the uh, the cost. Uh, polyurea is really well known for their high elongation and flexibility. So real, uh, you know, moving areas with a lot of moving cracks, dynamic cracks. These materials can be uh, can be used and and bridge cracks very very well. Uh, there again, it's a technology that's very rapid turnaround. And now, uh, in a general speaking in general terms, uh, in a matter of minutes rather than hours. Uh, for uh, either return to traffic or, or recoding, uh, also have high abrasion resistance. Uh, but they do take a specialized equipment and application. Not anybody can just pick up uh, this equipment and start installing polyurea. So the uh, mixing ratios are very critical. Uh, these have probably the shortest pot life of any of the materials out there. So uh, the, the the installer really has to be on top of a project to uh, to to use those materials. And then finally, uh, cementitious, there are a lot of advantages, very low odor, um, they're cost effective, they're, you know, you can get a lot of uh, decorative uh, options like we see here in the in the photo, but they're really limited in most cases to pedestrian areas. They don't have that, uh, you know, they don't have that uh, wear uh, for vehicular traffic as uh, the other technologies out there. Um, there's a lot of mixing involved with, with most of these materials, and like I mentioned before, really not suitable for, for for vehicular traffic and by themselves they generally don't have a lot of uh, um, crack resistance when when we're talking about areas of, of movement uh, so we you know some some manufacturers use these in combination I mentioned before the hybrid systems uh, they'll use them, these in combination with some of the other technologies that I've uh, I've talked about and talking about the hybrid systems that you know and this is where you know we get versus for unique applications, you know, every project's a little different. Uh, you could combine a, a one component urethane base coat with a multi-component urethane top coat. Uh, it's going to be cost effective with that cheaper base coat. Maybe uh, there's a lot of detail work and you, you want to have that workability with no pot life uh, using the single component base coat. Uh, that's that's fine. And uh, I mentioned before, you know, an epoxy urethane type system, then we get the wear of the, the epoxy and that strength of the epoxy and combine it with the flexibility and UV 
UV resistance of a urethane. So there, there are a whole host of hybrid systems uh, out in the marketplace, more than I, you know, we would have time to discuss uh, today. Um, but it really is all about combining those benefits of, of various technologies and kind of limiting the limitations. Um, kind of a tongue twister there. But uh, again, it, some of the times uh, there are limitations and, and that's really all dependent on the different technologies that are that are being uh, that are being used for the uh, for the material. Uh, so I want to start a little bit more on the uh, on the installation. Um, the evaluation, one of the big things is to do a condition survey and and take all of these different uh, um, all of these different items into into account when we're choosing the uh, the correct system. But I mentioned before, the installation is so critical to the success of these materials. And it starts with the substrate. It, we're only as good as what we're bonded to. Uh, so it really is imperative that we look at the substrate, we sound the substrate out, and we use the right materials to, uh, to, to uh, address some of those issues. Now, some Generally, uh, one of the most cost-effective and uh, long-term solutions is a cementitious uh, rapid set materials. Um, and again, you always want to check with the manufacturer on compatibility between your repair materials and your and your uh, your waterproofing membranes. But as a general rule, when we're using cementitious, we have to follow those industry guidelines of squaring us, uh, squaring our repair areas up, uh, cleaning and dampening to uh, an SSD, which is a saturated surface dry condition like we see here in the in the photo on the right hand side um, and it depends on the material you're using whether you, you know a material uh, manufacturer is generally going to call for a wet cure or not uh, generally in most cases they they will not if you have a little surface cracking, that's going to be detailed with your waterproofing, flexible waterproofing membrane anyway. Uh, so just need to be careful, especially using some of the sensitive uh, technologies like a moisture cure urethane, uh, that you're not introducing a lot of uh, moisture into, uh, into the installation. So uh, again, just as an overview, there are other ways to go about some uh, repairs, especially for little surface repairs, pop outs, uh, areas where uh, a previous membrane is being removed. And, and we all know what a, 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 the concrete can look like after that process is over. Um, one of the, a couple of the technologies used in the marketplace are making mortars uh, using a, either an epoxy, uh, like we mentioned, or a multi-component urethane. Uh, and this is where, you know, these, these different pop-outs can be primed with the straight resin. And then actually adding aggregate um, up to, in most cases, four to five parts of that sand aggregate to one part of the, the uh, mixed resin and making a mortar. And a lot of these materials are, are ready to go after a, in a very short uh, period of time. So those are really good for small repairs or fixing, you know, bird baths or leveling to drains prior to installing uh, the membranes. Now, in most cases, for all of these technologies, we want a, a you know a fully cured uh, concrete deck. Generally, the 28-day cure. Uh, check for moisture conditions. The the big one is in the industry is a, a minimum of using that plastic sheet method, which is D4263. Uh, I mentioned before the the concrete surface profile is so important. In most cases, going by the ICRI uh, 3102R uh, is a CSP of three is the most common um, profile that you're going to see out in the industry. And generally, you're going to get there through mechanic, uh, mechanical methods. Uh, we see here a shot blaster opening up that pore structure of the concrete, removing any weak layer of latents, and increasing the surface area. The more surface area we have to bond to, the better our long-term bond is going to be. Uh, and we always, we know in a lot of these cases, if we're doing balconies and other areas, we're not going to, the installer's not going to lug a, uh, a shot blaster up there. Grinding is another uh, impactful method to create a surface profile. Uh, the care there is to make sure that we're not polishing the concrete with our grinders uh, that we're actually creating that surface profile. But that's what's nice about that ICRI guideline and the CSP chips that come along with it, uh, that you can really you know, see uh, what a CSP3 looks like uh, so the installer can uh, you know, take whatever tools necessary and create that surface profile. 
cracks and joints uh, require pretreatment for any of these technologies. Generally, that's going to be, uh, in most cases, these flexible membranes, they can just be coated over uh, any cracks less than a sixteenth of an inch. Uh, that magic number just comes from the crack bridging tests that are part of the ASTM protocols for uh, for crack bridging. Um, anything over a sixteenth of an inch, you usually going to route it out. Most manufacturers are going to recommend a quarter inch by a quarter inch. Uh, we route that out and seal it with a, uh, a, a compatible uh, caulking material, compatible sealant. Uh, and then the important part is these cracks and joints are detailed. And what that is, is, uh, is what we call a pre-stripe. Now, a stripe coat is just an additional layer of protection where it's needed most. An additional level of base coat, that's giving us our flexibility and crack bridging uh, over those cracks. Uh, we can see here a perfect example, just four inch roller used to put a, you know, that, that uh, base coat two inches on each side of that crack, that detailed crack. Um, prior to installing the full base coat. So those areas around drains and penetrations and cracks and joints are getting double the protection of the waterproof membrane uh, as any of the other surrounding areas. And because these are the areas that are gonna leak the first, these are where uh, you know our, our issues are going to occur. So it's really critical that the details are performed correctly uh, when uh, installing these membranes. And, you know, a lot of us uh, familiar with sealants are always, uh, you know, talking about tooling the, the joints and creating that concave shape. Uh, but when we're looking at deck coatings and underneath deck coatings, we want to tool those joints flush with the surface. So we, we're not, uh, you know, we don't, we're not left with a little pocket to either hold water or hold uh, our, uh, our membrane, uh, which can lead to over application in that area and blisters and things. So uh, really, uh, and one, uh, some of the technologies that we, we talked about, uh, urethanes, you got to be careful. You don't want to use silicone sealants be uh, below a urethane uh, because they can both uh, react with each other and create curing problems and they won't really bond to each other uh, either. Uh, I mentioned mock-ups, really critical that we, that we do mock-ups before the project with these materials. Um, not only to show you know the sealants and and all the details and what a routed out crack looks like um and it's not just about color and texture that your color either uh, texture very important I mentioned before we have to offer that skid and slip resistance and this is where it gives us a chance it's hard to see what the slip resistance of a four by four little sample is going to be we need to be able to achieve a, a nice size mock-up and uh, really evaluate what the slip resistance uh, is and it, you know what what the needs are in that area and that's where a, a mock-up can really be impactful uh, I mentioned before over application of a single component urethane can you know can lead to bubbles and blisters and things and that's where the grid system comes in uh, you have to know you know be aware of the the manufacturer's recommended square foot per gallon uh, of their materials and that's that's where the installer can really you know lay out and grid their get, grid their job to make sure that they're not over applying uh, but they're not under applying either uh, wet film thickness gauges are great but it's very difficult to get accurate measurements on a really rough concrete surface like a you know a CSP of a three or a four so uh, very important that that grid method uh, the equipment used is pretty uh, pretty straightforward uh, flat and and uh, um, notch squeegees like like we see the notch squeegee there uh, they eventually wear so we got to be on you know aware of uh, how many square feet we're, we're doing and and you know change out those squeegees when uh, when appropriate spike shoes are always a, a necessity except for very small jobs because you, it, the installer needs to walk through this material uh, to install it correctly um, I mentioned the small rollers to uh, to fit in areas like that or to do our detail coats, our stripe coats to, over cracks and joints and, and uh, other details like that. As a general rule, the application is pretty straightforward. Here we see a primer going down. In most cases, manufacturers just have a use a flat squeegee and pull it as tight as you can for the primer. Uh, primer's main function is just to bond the system to uh, to the uh, the rest of the system to the substrate. And there are more and more uh, self priming materials out there where we can skip this step altogether and we don't require a primer. 
The base coat, this is where we're getting, the base coat's providing our true waterproofing layer. So we never want to stretch this. If, if a manufacturer is calling for 25 mils, need to put 25 mils down. This is the true waterproofing membrane. This is where we're getting our crack bridging. Everything over it is, is either to protect that or provide the skid resistance or aesthetic value that we're that we're looking for. Um, but it's basically you're squeegeeing and back rolling. All these materials, when, when a squeegee is used, you need to back roll. That's really gonna take all those squeegee lines out, um, give a nice uniform surface. And it also helps to break up some of the surface tension. So if you do have some of those detrimental ambient conditions, uh, much less potential for, for blistering uh, when these decks are properly back rolled. Uh, so as a general rule somewhere, you know, mid coat and intermediate coats are going to be placed somewhere between 60 and 100 square feet per gallon. Um, this particular slide says two to four hour cure. That's for a, uh, a multi component urethane. Um, but uh, if you're looking at maybe a single component urethane, depending on temperature, that could be anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. Um, aggregate, very important. This is where we're getting not only just some of our wear resistance from, but especially this is our skid and slip resistance. Uh, so, and that is really dependent on the size and the shape of the aggregate. There are a lot of different aggregates out on the marketplace. And that's where as a manufacturer, I can't give you what the, you know, uh, maybe the static coefficient of friction is on a, on a particular project uh, because it's so dependent on the type of aggregate that was used there, uh, as well as the, uh, you know, the how much top coat uh, was added over over that particular aggregate. But this is a very important part of the equation when you, when you look at aggregates. Um, so again, we have uh, all, all manufacturers are generally going to have, you know, a medium or a, a, a heavy duty uh, uh, a version of, of each one of these systems. So um, it's, it's important to understand those, uh, the difference between those. Um, again, there's several methods to broadcasting. We see uh, this gentleman feeding the chickens, um, which is perfectly acceptable. Um, you can either broadcast to a refusal, which is really broadcasting until that wet resin isn't accepting any more aggregate, or you can broadcast in back roll. So just broadcast a certain amount depending on the manufacturer's recommendation, and then you broad you back roll that material right into the wet coating. Uh, both acceptable uh, methods. And when we actually talk about the broadcast me means, um, is really, you know, we can do feed the chickens by hand here. They're backpack blowers and, and hoppers that are used out in the industry. So uh, every, manuf every uh, installer has their tips of the and, and tricks of the trade for that. And then finally, our, our lock coat, this is giving us our UV protection, our final aesthetic value. And again, it's gonna be installed by a squeegee and back roll. Uh, I generally recommend a little added slip resistance in most cases, especially, uh, you know, where we're looking at uh, that ramp in a stadium. Uh, they could be a wet condition with a lot of uh, pedestrians there. Little aggregate broadcast and back rolled into the final top coat can really uh, add to that slip resistance. And then uh, really the keys to the success for the whole process is really, you know, get some adhesion testing in, especially on recoats. See one right there, just, uh, you know, using pull tests for an adhesion. Mock-ups are, are so critical, both for, you know, adhesion and checking our slip and skid resistance and confirming that. Uh, proper surface prep, that is really uh, important. Uh, to for the whole process of installation. And I mentioned before the details, uh, the cracks and joints, all those areas where these, these uh, systems are gonna leak first, that's really, it's critical that we do the, that detailing. And, uh, you know, stay in the manufacturer's recommended mill thickness ranges and uh, the materials will work as, uh, as, as designed. Um, but again, from your perspective, you know, it all comes down when we're choosing these technologies and systems, it's every job's different. We have to go by what the, what the client's really needing. Uh, do you want, you know, the slip resistance versus a, a clean ability? All these things we have to take into account. And just remember from a technology standpoint, there's not that one magic bullet when we look at deck coatings. Uh, there are a whole host of technologies out there and they all have their place. Um, but it doesn't matter 
matter what the technology is, if it's installed incorrectly, it's not going to function as designed. So we have to understand uh, how critical the installation is to this whole uh, to this whole process. Um, and uh, that's uh, if we can follow those kind of guidelines and understand the benefits and limitations of the different technologies, then that's that's half the battle right there. So uh, I really appreciate your time uh, today, and this uh, concludes my uh, my presentation on traffic bearing membranes. Great, Dave. Thanks so much. Uh, wonderful webinar. Very useful information. Uh, well presented. Uh, as Dave mentioned, we are going to begin answering questions that were submitted during the webinar today. As a reminder, as we are going through these, you can continue to submit questions through your questions pane in your attendee control panel. Um, all right, Dave, got a couple of them for you here. Um, is there a need for joint sealant on square cementitious repairs? Uh, in most cases, uh, I would say no. Uh, generally, if you're choosing a repair that's uh, designed to be fairly similar to the host's concrete, um, it, there really is no, you know, and I assume you mean, you know, kind of uh, putting a joint around the, the perimeter. What we do recommend is uh, around that perimeter to, to detail that, uh, just like it's a, it's a, a, a prepared crack or, or joint. Uh, so an extra uh, coat of uh, base coat around the perimeter of a cementitious repair is a, is a good recommendation. Um, if there are a lot of shrinkage cracks due to the installation of the repair, then that whole repair area I would, I would treat as a stripe coat, basically a, a, a second a second uh, base coat over that area because those, uh, again, even the, if the repair product is designed, uh, you know, close to the host concrete, there's so many other variables that impact whether or not it may shrink and and have a little cracking around the perimeter of the uh, of of the of the material. So always a, a good recommendation to provide a stripe coat at a minimum around the perimeter. Great, thanks. Um, how as designers and specifiers are we to check the proper mill thickness that's being applied? Well, I mentioned before, you know, we use, see them in the field quite often. Uh, I, I, I've used them myself, the wet film thickness gauge, uh, and that can get you pretty close if, you know, you have to do a, a number of different readings and taking, a, taking an average because especially with a profile deck, a lot of times those can be resting on the, uh, on the peaks or, you know, down in a valley so it can skew the results. Uh, what I really try to instill in our installers is to use that grid method uh, and many of our installers, even the ones have been doing this longer than I have, uh, you see they, they put a little mark after, uh, for example, a, 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 buck, a, a bucket of base coat is, as a general rule is put down at 60 square feet per gallon. That bucket goes 300 square feet um, and a lot of the better applicators, they'll put that bu every th square, 300 square feet, there'll be uh, a little piece of duct tape or another bucket. And they'll say, okay, you, the bucket should be gone by the time you reach here, or and you should have nothing uh, extra left. So, really, the grid method and counting buckets is the only true way to know how much is down there. So it's about uh, understanding the manufacturer's recommended uh, coverage rates and the uh, overall square footage of the project. Are there certain concrete mix designs, for example, those that include siloxane sealers that will not allow adhesion of surface products? Yeah, great question. In in some cases, uh, especially some of the, uh, and I've seen silanes and siloxanes, um, it, it all depends on that the porosity of the concrete, how well they penetrated. But in most cases that I've seen, and and we've you know, I've done projects with a, a silane treatment uh, prior to the deck coating. Uh, generally, if, if a, a shot blast is going to remove and open up that, that structure, uh, but again, that's where if, if we know that exists or that's part of the project, uh, getting a mock-up in and ensuring that we're doing the right surface preparation to get, to achieve a bond. And whether that's a pull ta a pull, uh, a tab pull test as part of the mock-up or a full-on uh, pull-off test using an alchometer type uh, uh, 
uh, tensile pull-off ad adhesion tester. Um, it, that's where those mock-ups come into, into play. But uh, again, if the right surface preparation is done, you can be very successful going over those type of materials. All right. Uh, we've got a couple more that have um, kind of popped in here. What happens if a rain event happens during or soon after an application of a urethane vet coating? It's 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 just a bad day for everybody involved in most cases. It, a couple things. It, it it all depends on the timing and the technology you're using. So some of those you know some of the benefits of the using the multi-component materials, whether it's a you know two-component urethane or a methyl methacrylate, is those are going to start skinning pretty quickly. And if you have a, enough skin on there, and it it, it depends on if, if it's a doll deluge or a, uh, a a light rain but if it skins over sometimes you'll just have a little aesthetic you know maybe a little, few dimples on the top or it, you know it looks uh, blotchy uh, if it doesn't get down into the film sometimes you're you're fine of just solvent wiping it and squeegeeing it off and cleaning it up and and putting your next next coat on uh, if it's the last coat then you may have to put another coat on just for aesthetic means the the problem is if that moisture gets down into the film, that's where you start having these, uh, what they call bread loafing, where the material just turns into a big sponge. It's such a violent reaction with the urethane and the, and the moisture and the rain. Um, it just, it, it, you, can, you can actually push it down with your finger. It really does feel like a, a stiff sponge. And if that occurs, that, that needs to be removed. So it's really, the answer to that question is really, it's based on a lot of factors and it's gotta be a determination made on site after the, after the rain uh, event uh, concludes, uh, because you really need to check for some of those issues because it could just be aesthetic, uh, but it could also be a, 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 a pretty, uh, you know, a, a pretty big issue. Yeah, great, great, great question, great answer. Um, let's see here. Can these materials be applied to slab on grade or in similar conditions? Yeah, many of the, uh, you know, slab on grade, it's always okay. I would always lead off with a cementitious or something or an acrylic that's going to allow that slab to breathe. But uh, I've had a lot of success with slab on grade, split slab, uh, um, and, you know, unvented metal pan decks, all those, all those situations that if you look at a, a manufacturer's data sheet, uh, it, they'll say contact tech service, okay, or maybe don't do it. Uh, because they're all different. It really depends on the design of the system. If a split slab is draining correctly and those the secondary drains are functioning and everything's working, uh, then a lot of these materials can be placed on those type of projects. But the problem is, you know, when those materials, when the conditions change and, and it isn't draining properly anymore, that's where we can run into some problems. But uh, a couple of the best things we can do to combat, like slab, slab on grades, uh, combat those issues is to, you know, you really need to look holistically at the drainage and if you can get the mixed design of the concrete, have the manufacturer help you on that standpoint. Um, and then it's all about surface prep. The, the better uh, uh, surface prep you can do, the concrete surface surface profile, uh, using a, an epoxy or similar based uh, uh, primer that, that that you know is going to uh, really have a good uh, long-term bond with that concrete. Uh, we can uh, be successful in those areas, and especially if, and it makes a difference in the environment. If if it's not an, ex an exposed top deck, uh, I'm going to be very hesitant to do any uh, you know any of these uh, uh, coatings on. Sometimes, uh, if it's covered or you know below uh, where you know it's not uh, getting a lot of the uh, uh, changes in 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 uh in in uv exposure and things and uh we may have more success there so it, it really depends but uh, as a general rule you want to use something that's going to have the permeability uh to allow some of that vapor to to keep coming out of our slab all right we've got one more question um that has rolled in and of course if we've got uh, if you guys have more please continue to mm -hmm. submit those as we start to wrap up here what is the lifespan of a typical deck coating system? Uh, you know, typically, and 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 a a, a system isn't going to wear or you know evenly. Uh, there may be, and I it, it's the 
total tech service answer, but I, I have to start it off again with it depends. Um, if you have a, 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 a an airport parking garage with a helix and you have a tight turning area and all that shear, uh, you may see some wear of that, even a, a, a really heavy wear system after a few years. Uh, but the parking stalls in that same deck may, may be looking good after 10 years. Uh, so it really, it's so dependent on the technology, the thickness of the system, um, and, and you know, what was installed in the first place. But generally, you're going to see in those areas uh, around some of the turning areas, you may see some wear first, uh, which those can be, you know, those can be uh, – uh, squared off and and another uh, you know another coat put in those areas. But as a general rule, most of these materials have a lifespan of around 10 years or so. But I I hate to even put a number on it because you know there are going to be some areas of a deck that are going to last a lot longer than that. Uh, there are going to be some areas of the deck that are going to have to be recoded uh, much quicker than that as well. So um, I, I apologize for the grayness of my answer, but it, it really does depend on the situation and the technology that was installed. Awesome. Uh, that appears at this time to be the only questions that we have. Um, of course, the Master Builder Solutions team, um, you know, will be able to follow up with all of you um, should you guys have anything else that comes up that's job specific. So at this time, I'd like to thank Dave and the entire Master Builder Solutions team for providing us with today's great educational webinar. I'd also like to thank each of you for joining today. Um, as always, in the next few weeks, you can expect your AIA credits and your certificate of attendance that will be emailed to you. Um, once you exit today's webinar, you will receive a short survey on the presentation. Uh, CSG, Whitecap, and the Master Builder Solutions team would definitely value your feedback. Today's webinar has also been recorded, so you will receive a follow-up email with a copy of today's recorded information. On behalf of Construction Supply Group, Whitecap, and Master Builder Solutions, we thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your Wednesday.